Thank you so much for sharing your lecture. At this time, we'll open the floor for any questions from the audience. You can submit a question through the Q&A feature. And Dr. I Simo, see, you could see, I see yeah. seven questions in the Q&A. Awesome. So some may find it difficult to decide whether there is interception or is it a transient twisting? Whether we should follow up as either ileal is transient mostly. Yes, that is correct. So yeah, of course you would like to uh, redo it. You have to redo it, right? Uh, 30 minutes as, as I shared in my talk, right? Thank you so much. So coming to the next question. Um, uh, by uh, When do you do MRI in a patient suspicious of appendicitis? Uh, we haven't really, we usually do a CT. So uh, at our institute, we do uh, CT only. So I think ultrasound pretty much is very helpful. CT is also less often done in the pediatric age group. But yes, we do a CT. Thank you. So, and uh, that's done. So next is, what's the outer cutoff diameter of appendicitis? of so more than six millimeters is what we, what the literature says. Okay, thank you. So are the surgeons comfortable taking patients to surgery based on ultrasound alone? It Like there are clinical findings, there are clinical parameters, and they, of course, there's a lot of uh, thing with the confidence of the radiologist and the confidence of the surgeon that he has. So depending upon your confidence in diagnosis, demonstration, of the pathology, I'm sure the surgeons will definitely get the patient up for surgery. If you have those nice clips to demonstrate that that's what's happening, and you have those nice images to demonstrate, and they come and they see the pathology, they are very convinced, they'll definitely trust you and take you. I mean, like I know I do a lot of neck thyroid, parathyroid ultrasound births. The people take my, I'm, I'm very glad to have uh, come up to that level of confidence that when I communicate, it's very effective and it's taken with a lot of trust. So uh, again, it's a lot, ultrasound is such an operator dependent modality. So a lot depends upon the confidence. Saw the range 44 to 95%. So the sensitivity and specificity range for the diagnosis of acute appendicitis. So there is a lot of difference because that difference actually is coming from the learning curve, the operative experience, settings, and everything. So to my answer to your question, are the surgeons comfortable? I would say yes, depending on the, your, your confidence level. Okay, thank you. So this is all done. That's also done. Uh, as it pertains to the bowel obstruction seen in interception or in general pediatric cases, is there a standard objective measurement to classify obstruction based on age? Or is it a subjective assessment? We we already discussed the numbers, right? More than three millimeters or more than four millimeters is the thickness of the. Uh, oh, that's uh, you're talking about interception. No, yeah, you can actually see the it's the it's the target sign and the sandwich sign, basically the subjective assessment. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Next, is there any ultrasound criteria for mesenteric adenitis? Oh, you see the lymph nodes, right? And you see the size and you see the character and then you report them and you report the location because these can, uh, of course, they need to be treated and followed up. They can, as you see, they can become lead points for further pathologies to happen, right? Okay. Uh, can you show slides for preparation of hydrostatic reduction? Do you do X-ray abdomen to do blood perforation before the procedure? It's uh, perforation is clinically uh, suspected. We uh, we haven't normally done our, our pediatric department. Uh, pediatric doctor joins the ultrasound department, and that's where we do the hydrostatic re reduction as a team. So normally X-rays are not done unless they are really suspecting it. I mean, then they would probably just attempt it in the OT only and then make a call there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Madam, node size criteria for mesenteric lymphadenitis. Uh, I mean, lymph nodes can be as small. Their SEDs are often three millimeter, four millimeter, five millimeter, six millimeter. We just measure the SED short axis diameter and we quote them. There is no 
the size criteria as uh, as per literature that I've seen. So whatever I see, I report because even those tiniest of those lymph nodes, hypertrophic pious patches, those can also become the lead points. So we just have to document them if you see. So how many you see? Are there clusters or bunches or what do you see? Just uh, gives you an idea of what's going on inside yet for the position. Okay, thank you. So next, explain pylorospasm. Pylorospasm, I can pardon me. Pylorospasm, right? So that's like a spas, like a uterine contraction, like it's transient. So you just have to wait and you just have to evaluate it again and you'll see a different reading of the length of the pyloric canal. So when you go, oh, it was now, it's this, oh, now the reading is changing, now the reading is changing. So that's what you go. It's probably just a temporary spasm, which is coming and going away. So that is something you must always exclude before you give a diagnosis of uh, HPS, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis or something, right? Okay, so that's done. And uh, it's uh, how easy it is to find an inflamed appendage and exclude it with a scan along. Like I said, it's easy. First of all, you need to know the normal anatomy. Where is it? And then what are the possible locations of the appendix? Of course, uh, as we all know by anatomy, you can have uh, subhepatic, pelvic, or characteristic location. So you will look at look at there. So basically, the idea is to go to the terminal ileum ileocecal junction. That's where you'll find it. And it can be pointing in any uh, direction, right? So once you start with that area and you do the graded compression technique, it is easy. It is possible to do. So to answer how easy it is to find, it is easy. And we can exclude it with the scan again uh, alone. However, it is challenging. It's easier said than done. And of course, whenever you are in a dilemma, state support from your colleagues. There is a learning curve. Your confidence level will increase as you do more and more cases and you get more and more follow-ups and uh, you'll be able to give a confident diagnosis. So use the transducers, use the linear, the curvy and the other transducers, whatever gives you the depth and uh, follow it gently, you'll be able to do it. It requires patience and perseverance, yes, of course. And uh, is there any clinical significance of minimal pyloric thickness? No. So the, it just says over, uh, over a certain point. So that's why they said the smaller the borderline ones, they may just uh, resolve over a period of time. You just do a follow-up and you just measure because the child, <clears throat> they may be like between three millimeter and nine, there may be something in the middle, right? So which may uh, recover or which may go to congenital hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. So you just need to follow them up. So yeah, that's it. Oh, thank you. How long does intersusception take to become obstruction of oh, depends on the symptoms and I haven't known of this. It it depends upon the clinical condition deterioration. How long does it usually take? I I would say it would vary from case to say. Not that I've ever, ever observed this finding. So how much time can you wait? I think that's probably the clinicians may know better. Okay. And can you confidently differentiate between ileocecal and ileo ileal intersusception? I mean, it's basically what we are talking is small bowel inside small bowel and small bowel inside large bowel. So one is, of course, the anatomy, uh, the wall thickness, the outer wall thickness, the intersusceptum who's taking the receiving segment. How what's the thickness? Of course, uh, in cases of ileocecal, that would be more, and in ileal, that would not be that much thick. This can vary though, and of course, uh, location in the abdomen. So, if you see in target sign in dialect fossa, you're more likely dealing with ileocecal, and ileal, usually, you'll see that maybe a little bit higher up, usually, often in subhepatic or other areas. Please explain about pendicular lump. So when you see, when you see just an inflamed appendix with, uh, with or without a lid and just hyperemia, that's just appendicitis. However, you had any perforation or any bleed or any abscess or any collection or anything, all these we put in the umbrella of pendicular lumps. And then it has to be uh, managed accordingly. 
when suspect retrocecal, is it is there any sign on ultrasound and what's your next step? I mean, next step is definitely to go for a CT when you really suspect, but there's a lot of bile gas in front and you think it's there, but it's right behind there. But whatever maneuvers you do to the patient to turn left and right, so you can avoid the bowel gas and then you can try and scan behind. But if you can't do it, you just can't do it. You have to go for a CT. If it's clinically, there is a very high index of suspicion and that's what you're suspecting. Next step is a CT scan. And pylorospas and pyloric stenosis could be said to be the same thing. See, spas will come and go. Pyloric stenosis is a hypertrophy of the muscles. So if you rescan after a certain time or over a period of time, what disappears, maybe that was just a spas or that was just the early borderline scenario. But what you label as pyloric stenosis is something which may probably need a surgical intervention or another management. So they are different. They are not the same. That's the answer. Okay. Thank you so much. So all open questions have been answered. And I really, really thank you for all your questions. And I thank you to all the 250 plus people, all who logged in and uh, uh, were listening live to this on uh, to this talk. Thank you so much to each and everyone. Thank you, Amara and Line, for the wonderful platform and opportunity to share. Thank you.